Welcome everyone to today's uh, lecture. We um, stopped last time at uh, the description and discussion of the diamond model um, as one very fundamental um, theoretical framework for explaining the existence of banks. And you've seen that uh, the diamond model uh, gives you an explanation uh, for the existence of banks as delegated monitors um, in a world where we have, uh, where we don't have a perfect capital market, but we have financial markets with frictions like transaction costs, taxes, but most importantly, asymmetric information between lenders and creditors. So this is what this was. This part two point three, um, that is the diamond model, uh, and thus the backbone of financial intermediation, and we now continue with a very short discussion of the overall functions, more practical functions banks fulfill in an economy. Um, now, some of this doesn't work, okay. Um, we've already talked about um, the basic functions of banks, um, that is uh, coordination, allocation, and selection. I think selection is uh, quite clear and quite natural. Uh, that is, um, banks do have, just as any financial market would have to, um, banks have to select the market participants that are allowed into the financial market, into the market for deposits and into the markets for loans. Uh, how do banks do this? They select customers by screening, for example, the liquidity and the default risk and the credit risk of uh, lenders and creditors. So they restrict access to financial markets, uh, and this is something banks do instead of, for example, a stock exchange or any other participant in the financial market. Banks also help market participants to allocate capital, which is rare um, and scarce, more efficiently than in a market without banks. And Last but not least, financial markets and thus banks help to match lenders with borrowers and provide them with an opportunity to trade. So th these are the basic functions of banks we have already seen. Of course, this is more of an intu intuitive way of looking at the possible functions banks have. Now, um, the diamond model offers you a theoretical explanation for this. This is more intuitive explanation. And one can also see that just by listing these functions, we cannot fully explain the existence of a bank. Why? Because one could easily think of, for example, fintech companies, insurance companies, or other companies that can also offer these services. And we still need to ask ourselves, why do we need a bank? You know, the diamond model is a little bit more comprehensive in, in this respect. Okay. We've also seen that banks engage in lot size transformation, maturity transformation, and risk transformation. Maturity transformation is probably the easiest. You get um, short-term deposits as a bank, and you give out long-term loans. That is, you transform the maturities of the, your financing and your investments. However, this also means that banks always, by definition, Usually you will never get long-term deposits and give out short-term loans because you will always have short-term deposits and long-term loans. Mm. This means that banks will always have what we call a fragile funding structure. Banks always have a funding structure, a capital structure this, that is fragile in the sense that um, um, financiers can usually withdraw um, they are capital more easily from a bank than the bank can liquidate its assets. And remember that even though, for example, if you think of deposits as your own savings, and you will probably leave your savings if interest rates are a little bit higher than they are now, uh, you, although you are usually leaving your money and your capital for a long term and for a longer period of time at a bank, it is still short-term in nature because you could withdraw your capital any day. And this makes the funding structure of a bank usually very fragile. And this is the maturity mismatch. 
you should have heard this word. This is a the phrase with which this is usually referred to. You have a maturity mismatch um, on the asset and liability side uh, of a bank's balance sheet. Lot size transformation is clear and risk transformation. While this is now a little bit um, clearer now uh, after having seen the diamond model, because in the diamond model you could see that uh, there, at one point we make the small assumption that the bank by, uh, s um, by piling up loans um, and giving out more loans than just one loan, the bank can actually diversify. It can reduce risk by diversification in its loan portfolio, and thus it can reduce the total risk, and it will also transform risk. Because, for example, depositors only want to invest in a very small, very small amount of capital with low risk or no risk at all, at a small interest rate, whereas banks will give out more risky loans. And this is how they transform the risk that is accepted by um, depositors and the risk investors uh, are willing to take. So accepted and tolerated risk of financial contract. Those are matched and transformed. In addition to these abstract functions as in the diamond model or these more, little bit more practical ones uh, we've just seen, Banks also fulfill important functions for the economy. First of all, they supply and create money. Uh, in a couple of slides, we will see how money creation uh, is done. And they provide liquidity by investment services and facilitating money transfers. Um, this is something that is quite boring, actually. It has become more interesting uh, over the past uh, couple of years. But this is one of the most important functions a bank has. It is facilitating the transfer uh, and uh, the wiring of cash from one account to another. This is obviously something that nowadays could also probably be achieved by PayPal, Apple Pay and other tech companies, but uh, these things are only starting uh, and are still growing. But uh, think of the situation a couple of years ago where you did not have PayPal, you did not have Apple Pay and these, and not even Bitcoin to start with, but you only had banks to transfer money from one account to another. And if banks were suddenly to default and the financial system would default, the banking system would default uh, um, completely, then no one would be able to get a loan, but also no one would be able to transfer money from one account to another. You would not be able to pay your rent, uh, to buy food, uh, to pay your mortgage, uh, etc. Um, so facilitating and enabling people and households to transfer money from account to account, this is one of the most important functions banks have, even though this is not earning banks uh, a huge profit. Uh, this is just a way of of uh, being able to communicate with customers and to sell other products like, for example, loans. By the way, this is also quite interesting because obviously banks were aware of this but were not able to see that tech companies like Apple, Amazon, Google, etc. realized at some point that this is the entrance to um, a huge number of bank customers. Why is PayPal, why is uh, Amazon, especially Amazon and Apple, why are they now in the business for money transfer and uh, payment services? They're not, they might be earning a buck from that, but they are more interested in the data uh, and the relationship to the customer because they want to sell other products. Banks have done this for centuries. They keep the accounts of their customers. And then if you have a, uh, an account, say, with a Sparkasse, you are more likely to get a loan from this Sparkasse. Uh, money is transferred uh, through this account. And the bank can try to earn some profits of that. But banks didn't realize that tech companies were attacking banks uh, at this point. This is a pressure point for banks, obviously. Yeah. So this 
has become more interesting over the last couple of years, but uh, for some reason banks were not able to see the risk stemming from uh, tech companies here. So conversion, deposition, I don't think that's a good uh, translation, transport and financing, those are some elementary functions and you also have lot size maturity and risk transformation um, that are also fulfilled by banks. We've already seen the broad categories into which banking services can be uh, divided. Deposit business, deposit taking, credit business, loan granting, uh, sometimes discount business uh, if you are purchasing or selling bills of exchange, Wechsel, Wechselgeschäft in German, um, and last but not least, trading. Uh, trading on your own accounts, trading on someone else's account, uh, in more general terms, investment banking yeah. and securities trading. Safe custody. If you guard, if you administer um, securities or funds for someone else, this might be a service a bank offers. Investment banking, investment business, loan acquisition business. If you acquire claims or loans from someone else, this is a slightly different business than granting loans on your own. Um, what could this actually be? Or do you, you might, uh, if the German students might also have an example of a bank who is uh, doing this type of service and who is in this type of business. Any idea what is going on here? Usually you will not buy up loans that are performing too well, but usually you will buy up what type of loans? And what are NPLs? Non-performing loans. Non-performing loans, those are loans that, the, 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 there is a definition, I can't remember it. Usually it's defined as a loan that hasn't been serviced for one, two, or three months. Meaning that the customer hasn't paid up interest and notional for at least one month. So this is a non-performing loan. And a non-performing loan is something different than an already loan in default. Why? Obviously, if the customer is not paying up, if he or she is not paying interest, this, the value of this loan should be lower then in the case he or she is paying interest on time. But still, it might be that he's just in default for, say, three days and then pays up again. So you might be able to recover all of the money you are being owed. But still, there is a difference between a loan in which the customer pays on time and a loan in which uh, he or she does not pay on time or is in default altogether. So banks in the loan acquisition business will buy up non-performing loans and the bank will usually specialize on this type of loan. It will not grant loans on its own, but it will only buy up non-performing loans from other banks and specialize on retrieving and recovering money from this type of loans. And this usually is what we refer to as a bad bank. Nowadays, bad bank, a bad bank has a negative connotation, obviously, because it is bad in its name, but it has a negative connotation because during the financial crisis, uh, several banks had to uh, set up bad banks for its own company in order to uh, manage the non-performing loans and non-performing investments uh, the bank held on its uh, asset side of the balance sheet. But by definition, a bad bank is just a bank that specializes in retrieving and recovering money from non-performing assets and non-performing loans. And this is uh, not by any chance a negative thing. Uh, the financial crisis, as I said, put a, a slightly negative spin to this term bad bank. But way before the financial crisis, there were specialized, highly specialized bad banks that um, were in the business of managing and recovering cash from bad, non, from bad loans or non-performing loans. And one example, actually, you might have heard of this, but this is 
it's not a retail bank that's why it's, it's a little bit obscure for german customers and a very gen generic name the german bank ag uh, located in hamm Uh, Bank AG is the bad bank for the cooperative banks uh, in Germany. It's the bad bank der genossenschaftlichen Banken, also der Volks- und Raiffeisenbanken. And what this bad bank does is it buys up the non-performing loans from all over Germany, but just from the cooperative banks, from the mutual credit unions, and it manages those bad banks. Uh, and do you know what they are paying for this? How do you call this? Obviously, they will not pay 100% of the notional, of the fair value of this loan. But they will apply something that in English has this beautiful name, a haircut. Um, if you have non-performing assets, it could be a loan, but it could also be a security, you will apply a haircut, uh, meaning that you will cut out say 20, 30, 50% of the value. And if the loan has a value of say 100 euros, that's the fair value if the loan was performing, you will apply a haircut of say 50% and the bad bank will only pay say 50 euros. And both banks will profit from this. Why? The bank that has originated the loan gets 50 euros but it no longer has the risk that it could lose everything. So instead of being unsure about whether the loan is worth zero or 80 or 100, it will get 50 for sure. And the bad bank is specialized in recovering cash from non-performing loans, so it has an advantage, it has a specialization advantage and um, um, synergy effects that will enable it perhaps to retrieve 60 or 70 euros from this non-performing loan, so the bad bank will also make a profit. And this is the difference between, a, I would say, a regular bad bank and one of those bad banks that were only set up during the financial crisis because those bad banks, for example, for WestLB uh, and for other, uh, especially Landesbanken in Germany, uh, those bad banks were not meant to make a profit. They were only meant to... Um, decrease the potential losses that occurred during the financial crisis. And this is a bad bank. Guarantee business, if you assume a guarantee, uh, if you implement cashless payments, etc. This is all part, of course, of banking services. We've already talked about commercial banking and investment banking. Here again, you can see the definition or one possible way of defining the difference between a commercial bank and an investment bank. Usually, investment banking is concerned with the um, wholesale funding and the corporate business-to-business -business side of the banking business, meaning that in many cases it has to do with securities trading and wholesale funding for corporates. So, commercial banking can usually be reduced to deposit taking and credit granting, loan granting, uh, and everything that is connected to financial markets and securities trading that is investment banking. Uh, we will see this in more detail later on, but as you probably know, trading on one own account, IPOs, uh, mergers and acquisitions, those are the things that investment banks do. Okay. Financial services. Let's come now to the next uh, subchapter. Uh, what other financial services does a bank usually offer? Investment brokering. Um, broking? Brokering. The brokering of business involving the purchase and sale of financial instruments. That is investment banking. Either. Advising on investments. Uh, usually not retail customers, but uh, business customers, other corporates. Uh, could be both ways. Could be that um, you are trying to sell stocks or trying to sell financially engineered products, 
but it could also be that uh, corporate customers are in need of a specific financially engineered product. Uh, could, uh, again, broking. Um, anyone have an idea what financial engineering means? Is this is something that is closely related to investment banking. Financial engineering. If we were to translate it, this literally would mean that we are building bridges or something else in or building houses and machines in finance. But we are building not we are not building bridges and machines. What is financial engineering? Financial products are created for payroll. Yeah, but why? A stock is a financial product. We are not producing stocks. The the process of producing a stock is called an IPO or a seasoned off offering and if we issue a bond, we have a bond issue. That's not financial engineering. What, what is financial engineering? Now, remember what is a bond. Let's take a usual coupon bond with a 5% coupon. 5, 5, 5, 105. You would pay 100 notional, standardized to 100. No need to juggle with millions and billions of euros here just assume 100 euros five 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 dollar uh, euros interest and repayment of the 100 notional so that's a coupon bond what is the payout of a stock price at p0 dividend one dividend two dividend three and maybe dividend four plus P4. This could be the cash flow of a stock. You can see for a stock, the payments are stochastic. We don't know what the dividends will look like and we don't know the stock price in the future and so on. But what if we are actually interested in something like this? We get 105 now and we want to pay 10, 15, 50, and say 40. Hmm? In this very simple financial market, we would see, okay, either the 105, this is good price, or it's not a fair price. So we will start usually with just telling someone, okay, The programming for my pen has been lost, I think. Okay. So we take a step back and we just say, okay, we want to pay 10, 15, 50, and 40 in the future. This is a financial contract, just like the stock, just like the bond. This is a new financial contract. However, if we look for such a cash flow stream in the financial market, we would realize there is no such instrument. So we need to financially engineer this. And what is usually done is you go to an investment bank, you will ask the investment bank, could you engineer us such a cash flow stream? We need an instrument that pays out, no, that we have to pay into 10, 15, 50, and 40. And they will tell you, yes, we can do this, but we will only pay out 89.57. And then you can either accept this contract or not. But this is a financially engineered product. It is some random cash flow stream and you will probably go as a corporate customer, not as a retail customer, you will go to an investment bank and ask the investment bank, can you offer us such a product? Now, what is the investment bank doing? The investment bank will try to replicate this cash flow stream across all those financially engineered products and construct the cash flow streams on aggregate by using options, swaps, futures, forwards, stocks, bond investment, etc. It will offer you this and by offering this contract and 
applying a small margin to the price, it will make a profit. And by aggregating all those financially engineered in its portfolio, it will try to minimize the risk that something goes wrong. But this is a financially engineered product and it doesn't have a name. I made it up, but it could be that um, an investment bank would offer this to you. Why do you need to go to an investment bank? Because you could also look for some party, some counterparty that is willing to pay out this cash flow. But you, you need a potent um, counterparty with lots of cash and capital to be able to guarantee payment on this product. And then this is just a piece of uh, a sheet of paper you draw up and it's a contract with which you agree with the investment bank that both sides will stick to the cash flows they are required to pay. So this is something an investment bank does. By the way, if you've seen the movie uh, The Big Short, uh, it's, it works the same way with credit default swap. Christian Bale's character goes to Morgan Stanley and tells them, I need, uh, I need to, um, I need to enter a credit default swap contract on these funds, on these, uh, on these products. Can you give me this type of contract? Can you give me this specific, uh, specific financial instrument? And they say, yes, we'll have to calculate the price, but we are able and we are willing to enter such a contract. And then you have it. This is, and obviously this is not done for 100 euros, but on the B2B scale. Institutional investors, hedge funds, uh, pension funds, uh, investors will sit down with investment bank and talk about millions and billions and not about some retail products here. Okay. And this is also some kind of investment advice. So sometimes the investment bank will tell customers, why don't you buy a stock of Monsanto? Why don't you buy a stock of ThyssenKrupp? And sometimes they will also advise their customers on what they should buy and what products they could also get from the investment bank itself. Operation of a multilateral trading facility. In some rare cases, banks also operate uh, trading platforms. Placement business, IPOs, placing bonds and stocks on the market, uh, on the primary market to investors. This is something done frequently in investment banking and contract brokering purchase and sale of financial instruments on behalf of or for the account of others. This is also done by banks. Portfolio management, proprietary trading, non-EA deposit brokering, foreign currency dealing, factoring, financial leasing, asset management. We've already seen all these types of services in the specific um, sections of the German Banking Act. If you engage in any of these um, banking services, you are a bank uh, under German law. We've seen this. Deposits. We know that banks de take deposits, and that's clear by now. And by accepting deposits, they also play an important role for the economy. Um, an increase in deposits leads to an increase in the amount of money circulating in the economy. If all other factors are equal, money supply, that is the total amount of money in the economy, will also increase. And this is what we'll see in the credit multiplier model now. I've already hinted at the fact that banks create money. And I now want to show you how this can very easily be shown in a very simplistic model. But you will get the basic idea from this. So we are looking at a model of a credit multiplier. And it's based on the assumption that modern banks only have to retain a small fraction of the money they receive from deposits. So say I'm a bank now, uh, I get 100 euros in deposits, and if I give out loans, I don't need to keep 100 euros on my balance sheet or in cash, but I can give out loans and I only need a certain fraction of those deposits um, to be held back as a reserve in case I have to pay out the deposits again. So this portion is held back as a reserve so that the bank remains liquid in the event of a sudden cash withdrawal by depositors. The remaining part will be offered as loans or will be invested in any other way. 
And the assumption of the model is that I only have one bank and the required reserve, the reserve rate is 10% of all total deposits. Now what happens? We have this balance sheet. Um, I will translate the German words for you. On the liability side, we have a fully debt financed bank. We, have, we don't have capital, we don't have equity, we only have 50 euros, should be euros, 50 euros in, uh, no, actually it's 50 million euros uh, in deposits. And on the asset side, the bank will use 45 million euros to give out loans and it will keep 5 million euros as a reserve. And the mandatory reserve rate is 10%. So 10% of 50 million, 5 million, we need to keep 5 million as a reserve. Now, in period one, we are increasing the deposits by 50,000 euros, meaning that we now have 50 million and 50,000 euros in deposits, still fully debt financed, reserves increase by 50,000, we don't give out more loans, and you can see that by increasing the deposits that go directly into the reserve, in the mandatory reserve, the reserve rate now is 10.1%. And we can then again apply the 10%, 90% rule to the 50,000 euros in additional deposits, meaning that deposits on the liability side stay the same, but we can give out more loans now and we'll give out 45,000 euros in additional loans and we can keep 5,000 euros as reserve. And again, we have a mandatory reserve rate of 10% after having adjusted the reserve rate. Now, here you have the text. Assume the bank holds deposits with a value of 50 million euros, required reserves 10%, 5 million reserve, 45 for lending. Period one, increase deposits by 50,000 euros. Bank does not make profit just by depositing cash, so the bank should stay with the required reserve of 10%, so it can adjust the reserve rate and give out more loans. In period two, the bank returns to required reserve rate of 10%, therefore the bank is able to grant additional loans of 45,000 euros. Now in this example, the credit multiplier is defined as the relation between the changes in the deposits and the changes in the reserve, meaning that we need to look at the change in the deposits um, and the change in the reserves, and we can see that it's just the reciprocal of the required reserve rate, so 1 over 10%. The credit multiplier is 10. So far, so good. Okay. Now we're extending the model. We assume that there is more than just one bank. If bank A experiences an increase of deposits by 50,000 euros and retains 10% as a reserve, the remaining 45,000 euros can be granted as loans and it, it will eventually return to the banks. And the money is lent to an individual who reinvests it at bank B. And the bank, again, retains 10% in cash and invests the rest, for example, into lending this money again goes back uh, to bank C and so on. And this means that every step, every time the bank gives out a loan and the customer takes this loan to another bank, we can see that this leads to a growth of 90% compared to the original amount of money than before. And the sum of the additional deposits created with N banks therefore equals 50 original, 50 times 90% plus 50 times 90% squared and so on. And this geometric series converges to 50 over 1 minus 0 0.9, so it's just 500. And following the above formula, according to which the deposit multiplier is equal to the reciprocal of the required reserve, the grant of 50,000 euros into the system leads to additional 500,000 euros in deposits. So this is what happens. And the basic idea is that if a bank gives out a loan 
and this finds its way to another bank that only has to keep 10% as a mandatory minimum reserve. This goes on and on and on, and the next bank and the next bank is able to give out more loans again, and then this amount of money, the supply of money, is increased by banks being able to give out more loans um, and to only keep a fraction of the money as a reserve. This is a very simplistic model, so there are some disadvantages, disadvantages to it. First of all, the assumption of the simple model are not very, very realistic. Uh, the system has weaknesses, for example, that money can go overseas. This only works if you keep the money in one banking system, in one national banking system, and individuals invest their capital in government bonds or keep it as cash rather than depositing it. So it might be that you will not see a credit multiplier or deposit multiplier that is so high, but still the monetary function of bank deposits is uh, clearly visible. And even if it might not be as high as in this very simple model, you can still observe that including banks in an economy increases the supply of money. And this is one of the major reasons why banks are considered to be systemically relevant. Enabling the payment system to function properly, but also um, the increase in money supply and the ability to grant loans to firms that will spur economic growth. Those are the major reasons why, first of all, we have uh, systemic relevance of banks, and if banks are systemically relevant, we need regulation and supervision to be able to monitor banks and prevent uh, uncontrolled bank defaults. Okay. Well, actually, there's one slight mistake here. Um, again, you can. Um, you can try to classify uh, the different financial services offered by banks. And for example, here you can see that deposit-taking institutions uh, have a rather random capital flow to them, which is due to the fact that usually banks cannot fully anticipate when depositors will come and go to a bank. And if you have a more or a less random capital flow uh, that is defined by uh, contractual obligations, you will probably have non-deposit taking institutions and those are not only investment banks but more or less pension funds, investment funds, leasing companies and insurance companies. I told you that a major difference between a bank and an insurance company is that usually insurance companies can fully anticipate what premiums they are being paid to next period and in two years and in three years. If you have this set of contracts, you just know what amount of premiums are being paid to to the insurance company next year. So there's not too much randomness in the cash flows. Okay. So we have seen this. Deposits can be withdrawn arbitrarily. Amount of frequency can be determined freely by the lender, by the depositor. Uh, and this makes it difficult for banks to anticipate the changes in debt and investments at other financial institutions require usually require a contract that fully states the time and the amount of cash flows that will go to the bank. Hmm? Pension fund, investment funds, etc. Um, now, in EU countries, banks are allowed to offer a full range of services in the UK, the Financial Services and Market Act of 2000 allows banks to offer various services. This will probably change even more after Brexit, um, but this is what we have seen. And it's quite interesting, perhaps, uh, to have a look at the Financial Services and Market Act uh, in the UK from 2000. Uh, for example, here you can see that uh, in the UK, um, um, banks are allowed to operate in the following fields deposit taking, issuing electronic money, implementation of insurance contracts as a client, investments as client or agent, management of investments, and the instruction and advice on investments. So quite similar to uh, the German Banking Act, but uh, this is 
the situation in the UK. Um, now, during the last years, um, the banking, all banking sectors worldwide have seen uh, an increasing amount of conglomerates and large corporates that um, are growing bigger and bigger in size. And this growth is mainly driven by technology, globalization, but also by deregulation before the financial crisis. Um, we'll see this uh, in more detail later on, but uh, does anyone know what or why banks, especially in the US, uh, merged a lot and grew bigger and bigger in the 90s before the financial crisis and the dot-com crisis. Any idea? Has any one of you followed the presidential election in the US? Maybe the pre-election. Huh? After us, you're not from the US, right? I'm from Canada. From Canada. Okay, perfect. But I live <laughs> yeah. So you're an interested observer, and you can laugh at them. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, at some point uh, in the presidential election, especially in the race for the Democratic uh, nomination. Uh, you might have heard of Bernie Sanders, uh, the independent uh, uh, candidate who lost to Hillary Clinton in the Democratic bid for the nomination. And uh, one of Bernie Sanders' major slogans was, bring back Glass-Steagall. Hmm? Glass-Steagall, um, one has to know that in the US, most, act, um, most laws um, they enter the US code. The US code is uh, something like, for example, the German BGB. The, the US code is the set of laws that have been uh, passed by Congress uh, and signed into law by the president. Uh, but the US, Cong uh, the US code is a, is a huge set of numbered laws and no one knows what number, for example, uh, this or that law has. That is why most laws in the US have carry the name of the two sponsors that brought this uh, law uh, and the proposal for such a law to the floor of Congress. And in this case, Glass-Steagall were the two members of Congress. I don't know whether they were representatives or senators, but these two persons brought this law, this bill, to the floor of Congress uh, in the 20s or 30s, I think. So um, as a reaction to the, um, to the Great Depression, Glass-Steagall, uh, the Glass-Steagall Act uh, was the most fundamental law uh, in the US banking system, which did what? And if you know that Bernie Sanders demanded um, a return of Glass-Steagall, you might have an idea what it did. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, it's trying to connect uh, commercial banks and uh, yeah. banking. It is in, it installed a system where investment banking and commercial banking and depositing were separated. So Glass Steagall banned investment banking from commercial banking and vice versa. It prohibited commercial banks to offer uh, proprietary trading. And as a reaction to the Great Depression, Glass-Steagall uh, mandated that um, banks should either engage in investment banking, in trading, in proprietary trading and investment services, or in traditional good old fashioned banking like granting loans, taking deposits. And then in the 80s and 90s, uh, the financial system saw a huge wave of deregulation and along came GLBA, the Graham Leach Bliley Act. Graham Leach Bliley. Again, those were the sponsors in Congress. And Graham Leach Bliley Act did what? And f uh, 
Interestingly, this was done under the Clinton administration. It repelled, no, it repealed uh, the major provisions of the Glass-Steagall Act. And during the 90s, after Graham Leach Bliley, banks, commercial banks, were suddenly allowed to engage in investment banking. And how do you engage in investment banking? You buy up or you merge with an investment bank. So you, if you take a look at the average total assets of banks, you will see that it slowly increased and it went up through the roof in the 90s after Graham Leach Bliley because banks merged and merged and merged and they bought up investment banks. And nowadays there are, for example, Citigroup uh, and Bank of America uh, increased hugely in size during the 90s after Graham Leach Bliley. So we have Glass-Steagall, the left in the US is still demanding a return of Glass-Steagall to separate commercial and investment banking again. Graham Leach Bliley, you might have heard of Paul Krugman, a Nobel Prize winner in economics a couple of years ago and a famous uh, op-ed writer, I think, in the New York Times. He's, he's very prolific in his writing. Paul Krugman once said that there is probably there are probably mm, no one more responsible for the financial crisis than Graham Leach Bliley. Yeah, so Graham Leach Bliley, the Graham Leach Bliley Act is in part blamed for the financial crisis because banks were suddenly allowed to engage in risk taking and uh, this was unhealthy as seen during the financial crisis. Next thing, Graham Leach Bliley, after the financial crisis, the Dodd-Frank Act was enacted. The Dodd-Frank Act again repealed some provisions of the Graham Leach Bliley Act and it forbade proprietary trading again. And as you might imagine, it was the Dodd-Frank Act also saw many provisions on uh, customer protection uh, and uh, client protection. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, it worked out quite nicely. Uh, the Dodd-Frank Act also uh, forced banks to recapitalize. And as you can imagine, this is one of the major acts Donald Trump wants to abolish, quite clearly. Yeah. So Dodd-Frank Act, Graham leach Bliley Act, and Glass-Steagall Act, so those are the most important acts and laws in the US. And the European Union did something else uh, and something similar. They had the second bank directive in 1989 uh, and the European Union also deregulated and they also um, revamped the European banking system, but mostly in order to uh, enable the financial system in, within the European Union to integrate more, to have an integrated, open um, and frictionless financial system within the European Union. This is why nowadays, for example, we have Banco Santander, we have Targo Bank, which is owned by a French company. Uh, we used to have SEB, a Swedish bank group. We have ING Deba, the ING group, ABM AMRO, uh, and uh, other European banks from Spain, France, Italy, etc., that now operate uh, without any problems within Germany. 20 or 30 years ago, this was not possible, and we only had German banks uh, in our banking system. So this is something that has been changed in um, the uh, European Union. Uh, there have also been some uh, laws after the financial crisis. We'll have a look at those later on, but those are the most important ones uh, in the US. Okay. Won't ask too much. Um, Again, I think we've talked a lot about most of these uh, services that are offered by banks. Um, payment services, money transfer, checks, credit transfer, standing orders, direct remittances, payment cards, credit cards, uh, EC cards, Euro check card, etc. Nowadays, we also have other types of digital payment transfer services. And you might also include Bitcoin, but this is something that is not being offered by banks, of course. Okay. 
deposits and loans we've already seen this and investments age provisioning insurance products online banking um, I think by now it should be clear what types of services banks uh, are offering and last but not least we also have online banking now online banking is quite interesting because when it started it seemed that online banking was merely a costly uh, additional service on the side to customers uh, where banks could not make a buck uh, at some point online banks entered the market and uh, uh, showed to traditional banks that actually you can also earn profits in online banking if you just reduce your costs and try to cross sell products via uh, your checkings account and online banking now the main reason for this development of course at first was with the um, with the um, a dawning of the internet uh, banks had to offer this at some points they saw that online banking uh, is also cheaper uh, online banks um, offered services much cheaper and offered better rates than uh, traditional banks but it is so interesting if you see that again the internet is more than 20 years old and only now we are seeing companies coming up with uh, digital versions of traditional banking ideas uh, which we now call fintechs uh, what are they offering they are offering that for example you can transfer money uh, faster and more easily than with a with a bank uh, and it's for me it's interesting because i mean online banking has been around like 15 or 20 years and only now we have new competitors in this market and only now are banks realizing that people will in the future will no longer go to a branch they will just use online banking and if you're interested in, in this i would advise you to to look on the internet for some of the crazy ideas fintechs have come up with um, i think one of the one of the most i i didn't really get this uh one of the weirdest ideas i saw was um and and like how should i should i should describe it uh, a cartridge box uh, a paper box uh, you could order then you can fold it then it looks a little bit like uh, like a pyramid where you have a, a slot where you can enter and when you can put some paper in it and then what this is is you can use your own uh, smartphone you can put your smartphone on top of this cartridge box take a picture and then the idea is that you can um, you can um, you can scan you can take a picture of documents financial documents like say credit card um, uh, documents and uh, and contracts etc insurance contracts and you can take pictures um, you can install an app on your smartphone this picture will be incorporated into this app and the app analyzes uh, of course by using artificial intelligence analyzes um, the document and then tells you uh, after having done this you can simply put it in this box fold it like uh, like a paper box um, and the app tells you okay this or that document is stored in this paper box and you can just scan all your documents you don't need to you don't need to order them and you don't need to sort them you just put it in the box scan it put your put your uh, smartphone on the box scan it and then the app does the rest for you now at first i thought okay this might be a nice idea but who does this i mean especially you can immediately see why they are offering you this service they want your data they want within this app and within this application they want to know every time you went to a pawn store you went to a bank you went to um, uh, a food chain or you went to mcdonald's and they want to analyze uh, your financial footprints so why should i give my data to this company for the benefit of being able to store a couple of uh, sheets of papers uh, in in a couple of minutes less 
I'm quite old fashioned. I simply take my sheets of paper, I, I take my bills, I pay them, and then I, I have a couple of folders and I can sort 10 folders. I mean, this is not too hard. But this is an area where a lot of things are being done. And I can remember uh, almost seven, eight years ago, uh, when I was still at the University of Dortmund, I invited a very small, uh, one of the founding partners of a very small company called French Surance. And at that time, they were the first um, insurtech. And nowadays, they are actually, um, they are not simply selling the company and their products to other insurance companies, but they are actually, uh, they have grown a lot. And I would guess that they are one of the few uh, profitable and one of the few fast growing insurtechs in the market. And what they do is, um, at that time, uh, it was closely connected to Facebook. I don't think it is, n it is any longer. But the idea is that, for example, um, I have a bike. I want to insure my bike against theft. And what usually an insurance company is interested in is, um, oh, how do you call it in English? Uh, in German, it's Selbstbehalt. Um, a small amount of money you are always required to pay in case of a loss. So for example, if the bike is stolen and uh, you've agreed to, uh, you have agreed in the contract to cover the first 300 euros, for example. Deductible? Deductible? Yeah. So this, an, an insurance company is always interested in including deductibles in an in insurance contract. Why? Because it gives an incentive to the uh, insurance uh, customer uh, not to defraud the insurance company, uh, to be more vigilant, uh, and it reduces the average cost for the insurance company. And what ins for insurance, for example, does is uh, it sells insurance contracts, and you can come up with a couple of friends, and the deductibles will be covered by your friends. And your friends agree that in case, for example, my bike is stolen, they will pay 300 euros. And the insurance company is able to reduce the premium rates on this contract, and you and your friends will get a slice amount of this reduction in premiums. So in theory, everyone wins. You, you get an insurance contract with a better premium, your friends uh, get a small um, payment, in case your bike isn't stolen. French Insurance is able to sell a contract. It's not producing contracts. It's not an insurance company. It's only selling contracts for other companies. And the insurance companies in the background, they are able to get new customers. So this is, this is a business idea that could work, actually. But online banking is, is quite interesting. Let me ask you, uh, has any one of you ever tried out uh, the scanning function uh, for uh, an online banking smartphone uh, money transfer? Okay. Probably I shouldn't show it to you. The idea is, I don't need to pay any bills. No problem. Um, the actually, I was surprised myself. I mean, Smartphone, online banking apps are so sophisticated nowadays. Nowadays, even with the Sparkasse app, you only take the bill, you only take the sheet of paper, you take your smartphone, you take a picture, and the app will analyze all the data on this scan, and it will enter all the details for the money transfer automatically. So I just take a picture, I look, okay, seems okay. Uh, I scan my finger, money transfer is done. But then again, I have to say, okay, if even the Sparkas, even the savings and loan banks can do this nowadays, what is there left for a fintech? I mean, this, is, this was a nice idea two or three years ago. Everyone tried to, 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 to play with some applications on a smartphone, but I think the market for fintechs will, um, it will slow down at some times and only the good apps and good companies will survive. Okay, online banking. It will be interesting to see where this goes. Um, another side effect, of course, of online banking is that nowadays bank branches are closing down 
uh, by the hundreds, I would say, a month. Uh, banks no longer need the vast networks of bank branches they operated uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and online banking and digitalization goes hand in hand with closing down of branches and reducing uh, uh, staff. I mean, you can read through all this and you, you will probably know what online banking is about and you are probably using um, online banking. I only want to point out two things that I think will be that will be interesting and relevant in the future. First thing is security. With more and more things being done uh, digitally, um, the safety of money transfers and the safety um, of online banking will become more and more important. Uh, and second of all, um, s uh, something that is now a hot topic in the European Union that is called the PSD2. And this is related to big data because we've seen that tech companies only enter this market because they're interested in the data. They don't, they, they don't want to earn money and make a profit of some, some bank service. They want your data. And this is the type of data even Google doesn't already have. They know your age, they know your gender, your, they know your, uh, your consumption pr uh, preferences, uh, and they know your browser history, but they don't know your account. They don't know, know your financial footsteps and your financial footprint. So this is something they're interested in, and one has to see that Every time you agree to use a financial payment service, like for example, PayPal or something else, you of course will agree to the usage of the data by the company. Otherwise, you will, you will not be able to use this payment service. So PayPal, Apple Pay, etc., they have your data and they can use it because you have agreed to it. And PSD2 uh, is what? Does anyone know? It's the Payment Services Directive 2 uh, that came into effect, I think, in January in the European Union. And what is the PSD2? What does it state? First of all, it's meant to give some power back to customers because it means that you and only you are the lord of your data. And if you want to share your data, you're free to do so. But why are companies going crazy about PSD2 and banks and non-banks? Because at first this sounds like customers get more power. And if customers get more power, companies will, will lose their grip on, for example, the data they have. But what is, what is the idea of the PSD2? No one knows? Okay. The idea is that if you are a customer and if you agree uh, let's make it. Let's make it as, uh, an example. I'm a customer with, say, you're a bank now. I'm your customer. I have my uh, uh, checkings account with you, and you can see all the transactions I've done. But this is still my data. If I, for example, engage um, with this company here, and you tell me you're interested in analyzing my finance. Uh, my finances and you're in a, interested in you're offering a service related to my finances I could give you my information but I'm too lazy to do this and this PSD2 now enables you to say that uh, dear customer please allow me to retrieve your data from other companies and I just say yeah do it and you can go to the bank and you can say Customer A has agreed to give out his data and the bank is forced to give out the data. Before the PSD2, the banks more or less were, were required to give out the data, but they never really did. And they could, uh, they could hide and they are still hiding behind technical problems. They could argue, sorry, our computers don't work. We don't have the right interface to give you the data, but 
obviously for me as a customer, this is quite convenient. And for other companies, this is a huge, um, this is a huge treasure because now they simply have to ask their customers, dear customer, am I allowed to retrieve your financial data from your house bank? And if I say, yeah, do it, they can go to the bank and say, give out all your data you have on this customer. And this is the, the main point of the per, uh, Payment Services Directive 2 now. And this is why, first of all, it gives power back to the customer, but also many non-bank companies and many non-banks are now looking to get their hands on the data the banks still have. And it's the same principle as with PayPal or Apple Pay. They want the data. They don't want the profits. They don't want to make money here. They want the data. Okay. So this is online banking and I would say digital banking. It's no longer just online. Yeah? Online banking sounds a little bit like Oh, I have my online banking portal and I can, I can have a look at the, the, my current uh, checkings account. Uh, but digital banking is much more. Um, yeah. And I don't think this is too interesting here. Um, banks also engage together in forex trading platforms um, and, and some other types of services. But this, this is not as interesting as... I think as digital banking and online banking. Okay. Now, is online banking profitable? I said this already. No. Yeah. Only if you are able to get new customers, only if you are able to retrieve data you can exploit, and only if you are able to be much, much better than your competitors. But I would guess that even today, uh, there are some things, even Sparkassen in Germany at least, uh, the state-owned banks and the credit unions and the cooperatives, even they can roll out new applications quite quickly. Um, they cannot completely revamp their whole system. But if it's just a small application that can scan bills and transfer the money and insert the information automatically, this is rolled out in a couple of months and uh, no one, no bank uh, is able to get a unique selling proposition just from online banking. Yeah. However, there is one good example. Last year, I had a guest speaker here who was the Wiz, the marketing chief uh, and head of marketing for a small private bank. And I've, unfortunately, I've forgotten the name. It's part of the um, Italian Mediolanum group. Uh, what was the name again? Bankhaus. I have to look it up. Um, very small private bank, rich customers, of course. And they have, they used to have a website that looked like a website from the 80s. And then he told the story that at that point when he became head of marketing, he immediately set up um, and immediately started to overhaul the whole website, to overhaul the online banking. And now this small bank is earning prizes uh, and, uh, um, and prizes um, and awards for their online banking. So I wouldn't say it is profitable and it will never really be a unique selling proposition so that you would say as a customer, I need to go to this or that bank because they have such a lovely and very nice convenient online banking. But if your online banking is outdated and looks like a website from the 90s or 80s even, you will probably not be a customer for long. So you can do a lot wrong, but you don't, you cannot really do much good there. Mm -hmm. And most of these applications on the smartphone, um, they. They, even for the Sparkassen and Volksbank, they are rolled out quite quickly. Uh, there are some uh, studies by the European Central Banks that try to uncover the possible doubts about the profitability of internet banking. And those studies, um, they say that advertising expenditures, initial investments are very high. The number of new accounts, 
is not developing as expected. The habits of customers are difficult to change. There are some also some doubts about safety. These are studies that they, they are not from 2018, but they are a little bit uh, older than that. But um, this is, I guess, one reason why banks never felt the necessity to invest too much into online banking. They just saw that it only costs money. People only use it uh, to check their account uh, and maybe to transfer money once or twice but they still went to the bank branches and they never faced uh, a competition from the tech companies and this has changed now. Online banking can reduce a bank's costs since less staffing would be necessary. Costs can also be saved if your stores and branches are needed uh, and so on. Um, still, online banking has a lot of potential. And this is another facet of uh, digital banking. Um, Obviously, uh, banks also face competition from another um, type of competitors. And this is peer-to-peer -peer lending, crowd lending, crowdfunding, and crowd investing platforms. Uh, has anyone ever heard of Prosper.com, Smava, Companisto, or uh, Aux Money? Okay. Prosper.com, have a look at that. Prosper.com is, uh, the, I think it was the first, at least it's the uh, most liquid and best running crowd lending platform. This used to be called peer-to-peer -peer lending in the 2000s, dating back to 2003, 2005, 2006. This used to be called peer-to-peer -peer lending. Nowadays, the more fashionable uh, uh, term is crowd lending. Uh, what is Prosper.com? If I need a loan, I could go to a bank. If the bank doesn't give me a loan, and this uh, is more relevant in the US, uh, I go to Prosper.com and I create a listing for a loan and I say, hi, I'm Gregor, I'm 37 years old and I'm in need of 10,000 euros. Please lend me your money. And you, as investors, you go to Prosper.com and you invest into loan listings. But you don't need to lend me 10,000 euros. I would get 50 euros from you, 200 from you, 50 from you, 100 from you. And you will diversify across a huge set of listings. And the crowd will then finance and fund my listing for a loan. This is crowd lending or peer-to-peer -peer lending. Prosper.com only offers the platform and they will charge a fee and they will offer basic banking functions like risk management. For example, I did this uh, in the 2000s on smava.de, the German variant of Prosper.com. Smava for smart value, same principle. And any idea what the problem on these platforms is. It's, it's very interesting to analyze this uh, scientifically. What is, what is the major problem on these platforms? One term, two words, yeah, idea. Missing information about unreliable clients. Missing information, in other words, asymmetric information, and asymmetric information leads to adverse selection. Which type of people go to such a platform? People that didn't get a loan with a bank, that didn't, didn't get a loan with many banks. So this platform or this type of platform usually attracts, adversely attracts people with a bad credit score. So in order to reduce default rates and to offer some kind of protection, for example, Smava had the system that they rated C, D, E, F. They rated all listings and all loan applicants into rating classes based on their Schufa rating. Schufa is a very special German thing. Schufa is something, it's a private uh, corporate, it's a, it's a corporation, uh, no, it's a, an association, it's a private association that gathers information on the defaults of private households. 
So every time, for example, you buy a, a TV with MediaMarkt or Saturn, you might have seen this if you have an Erasmus or exchange student. Every time you buy, for example, um, something on credit like a TV and you default, the information that you have defaulted is passed on by the merchant to Shufa. Uh, and any time you want a loan, the bank or the company, the merchant company, will ask Shufa, please give me the information on this applicant. And they will tell you, ah, oh, this person has already defaulted three times on its loan. And then you know, okay, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You have a bad Shufa rating. Hmm? You will be rated into these rating classes. And for example, in A, I did this in 2007. I think I got 2% here up to 16% interest in class F. And uh, in rating uh, class F, each, within each rating class, a small portion of the interest rates are paid into a deposit insurance, an insurance pool. And any time, every time a loan defaults, the investors get their notionals back over time from this pool, but not interest rates. So you have a type of credit insurance, and this is the mechanism how, for example, Smava tri uh, tries to prevent adverse selection. Uh, however, I have to tell you, I invested some money here, I had a, an average return of, I think, I think five or six percent over five years. So I had a five-year maturity, uh, and I get, I, I got five or six percent. But my favorite uh, 100 euros uh, was in uh, class F. It only took the guy two months to default on his loan. Two months, and the first 100 euros were gone. I was repaid out of the insurance pool, but of course, because I need to wait five years for all those small amounts of money to be uh, being repaid, the interest, the, the return on this interest is slightly negative, because I have to wait five years to get my initial 100 euros back. But still, the average interest rate was five or six percent, but in some cases, the loan applications were ridiculous. Yeah? My favorite was, Hi, I'm 27 years old. I've just started my apprenticeship, Lehre, which tells me that if you start your apprenticeship uh, at age 27, what have you done the last 10 years after school? Um, I just married, and we want to go on vacation after our marriage, and I need 20,000 euros for the vacation. Rating F. So that told you everything you needed to know about this loan application. <laughs> so in some cases, those applications and those listings were ridiculous. Yeah. But still, again, for me, at that time, I did my PhD. I wanted to try this out, and I wanted to gamble. And I guess so, 5 or 6% were OK in the mid-2000s. But adverse selection is a problem. Uh, and Prosper.com, Smava, they still operate. They, I think they still grow. Uh, but it's not the competition some people thought of uh, they would be for banks. Because, I mean, this is the, the pure lending business of banks. Crowd lending, at, one, at some points, people thought that these lending platforms could be a real competitor to traditional banking. But adverse selection, because banks also have risk transformation, maturity transformation, which cannot be done on this platform. This is something, um, it seems that um, they cannot fully replace banks. But you also have crowd funding and crowd investing. The difference is that um, you do not lend money to private households, but you lend money to, you either invest in equity of a company, of a startup, or you fund specific projects of a startup. And this, for example, is uh, one example is Companisto. Aux money is, I think, also uh, lending and uh, funding. Uh, so there are some platforms on which you can become a venture capitalist. You can invest a small amount of money uh, with a crowd uh, in a startup. 
and you can either finance a project with debt or you can with a loan or you can buy equity of this company and those are some additional uh, developments here they are not really online banking but as you might imagine everything is uh, going on the internet everything is taking place on the internet yeah? okay so we have talked a lot about the diamond model last week uh, you've seen the variety of functions banks offer um, it is nowadays i think banking could become sexier than it was 10 or 15 years ago uh, i always have to say that when i studied business administration banking was definitely the last subject one would have needed to force me to take and i didn't take it because i thought what could be more boring than banking yeah? maybe insurance okay so i took finance and corporate finance and capital markets but nowadays I think banking is becoming more and more interesting because we can see that uh, banking as a business that deals with money and wholesale money um, that is relevant for a financial economy that can do um, good to an economy that can uh, spur growth that can support economic growth, uh, growth by lending by giving out small loans to uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, but that can also destabilize a financial economy. Um, banking has become more and more interesting. And finally, of course, uh, because nowadays, uh, all those nice hip companies uh, from the tech industry, they try to take up business that has been left by banks lying around for decades without any attention uh, drawn to it. Uh, so banking has become more and more interesting over the last couple of years. Now for the next week, uh, we will talk about central banking. Because as you might imagine, uh, banking is also interesting because it takes, uh, it takes uh, ideas from not just business and not just management, but we also need to have a proper understanding of the mechanisms under which a central bank operates because in the end, banks get their money supply from the central bank they are being supervised in germany at least in part by the central bank uh, and we will have a look at central banking next week and then go on back to business models accounting risk management in banks do you have any questions okay so if you have no questions thank you for your attention and see you next time <laughs>